We have the same problems everybody else has in the same proportion. We have major, major issues in the same proportion. I don't think that the Muslim community is worse off, but we expect more from the Muslim community. You know when people, sometimes people are like, I can't deal with the Muslims anymore. I don't want to work with the Muslims anymore. I don't want to go to the masjid anymore. Muslims are messy. They're not messier. Yes, they're messy. They're just not messier. But you wanted to believe they weren't messy, so you got yourself out of what you deemed a mess because you thought that Muslims who are just messy were messier. Did that all make sense? No, none of it made sense. They're as bad as everybody else in many different things. And we like to think that we will be different as a community and that we can expect more. The truth of the matter is that it's tough. It's tough dealing with Muslims, it's tough dealing with people, it's tough dealing with the community, it's tough dealing with the masjid. It's still worth dealing with everything that comes with the community. But on an individual level, there is a weak narration, but it's strong in its meaning that if a person taunts someone else who's committing a sin, they will not die until they commit that same sin. And we have a tendency to see other people falling into deep holes. And at some point in our lives thinking that will never be us. I had this flashback, I actually was in Louisiana over the last week and I was, me and my wife were taking the kids through like our family history and showing them like all this, the old masjids, old apartments, old schools, everything that we did. And subhanAllah, I just had this flashback of sitting in Islamic school, Sunday school, and the teacher talking about drug addicts and all of us kind of looking around at each other like, yeah, right, that would never happen to us. And subhanAllah, so many people ended up in jail for not just being users, but for being sellers as well, that at one time mocked the idea that they too could fall prey to that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows man has been created weak and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows as well that when we put ourselves in proximity to trouble then we end up dulling our senses and our better selves and ending up in things that we previously would have thought were unthinkable. We would never become. You start off a relationship, you justify one thing, then you say, well, I've already gone this far, I might as well take this next step. Well, you know, it's bound to end up here, let me just go this far. You start going down paths, and that's why the emphasis is on proximity. Don't come close to zina. It is a wicked, or it's, it's a, a shameless sin, it's a dark path. Once you get on that path, you won't know how to turn around at times, you'll just feel stuck and you'll keep sinking further and further into that sin. I want us to think about it from a much deeper level. Have you ever committed a sin that gave you long-term happiness? Have you ever done something that was disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and something that you really knew that you shouldn't have been doing, but you thought that if you got into it, that it would bring you happiness and it actually brought you happiness. How many people that actually turn their backs on divine guidance and actually take those dark paths end up finding what they are looking for? The answer is most likely close to zero. There are very few people that actually go down that path and actually find fulfillment. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is not why are we committing those sins or those particular sins being specific to those sins or specific to those behaviors? But what void did I have inside that led me to that? And I want you to contrast, I want you to think right now, and this is actually a thinking session for yourselves and me. Take a moment, 10 seconds. Think about something that you did in life, a good deed that you did, that really made you feel fulfilled. Keep that good deed in your head. Think about a sin that you committed that caused you regret. Compare how you felt after that good deed as opposed to how you felt after that sin. And Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said that every sin that you commit is a temporary pleasure followed by a lifetime of regret. Whereas every good deed that you do is a short, is, is a short time, a fleeting moment of struggle followed by a lifetime of joy. The fulfillment that you feel when you do something good. Now what good is and what bad is, those are specifics. But when you do something good, the level of fulfillment that you have knowing that you struggled for something that was worth it, that in the process, hopefully you earned the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you became that much closer to living up to the potential that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to you. That fulfillment of actually restricting yourself, finding the willpower and the self-determination to restrict yourself from things that you didn't wait for someone else to step in and get you, but you yourself, caught yourself and said, you know what? This is not the type of person that I want to be. 
A lot of times, subhanAllah, in the psychology of doing hasanat and the psychology of doing sins. One of my teachers told me something very powerful. He said that when you commit a good deed, don't see yourself committing the good deed, keep your eyes on the good deed. What did he mean by that? If you see yourself committing the good deed, you might move beyond a phase of encouragement and feeling content with what you're doing to a stage of arrogance and being conceited. So keep your eyes on the hasana itself. Keep your eyes on the good deed itself. Don't see yourself doing it because shaitan would much rather that you take pride in your good deeds and hence reach a station of pride and arrogance and become judgmental and deluded by what you deem good. Shaitan would much rather that than a person that is falling behind and knows that they're falling behind and wants to get better and is making some sort of effort to get better. So see the good deed, don't see yourself committing the good deed. But when it comes to sin, see yourself committing the sin, don't look at the sin itself. What does that mean? If you take a step back and you think of yourself committing that sin and you look at it and you say, how do I look right now? Is that the person that I envision myself becoming? Saying that, doing that, being that person. And if you take a deep look at that and then you realize that's not who I wanted to be. That's not what I'm capable of. And don't look at the sin itself because the sin can be decorated and beautified. But you know what? That's not what I wanted to be. And here's what shaitan tries to get you to do. In a temporary moment of ignorance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that temporary moment of heedlessness, he wants you to do something so stupid that you'll feel like you can never recover from it. So while you're at it, mess up as much as you can. So in that temporary moment of heedlessness, you do something that's permanently damaging so that you can't come back. Or at least you feel like you can't come back. So it started off with a little thing, but you know what? Why don't you, you know, ink it in a little bit? Why don't you get a few tattoos while you're at it? Why don't you, why don't you get, a, you know, get yourself in some trouble so you have a, a criminal record? He distances you so far so that when you wake up to your senses, you're like, I can't come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He tries to sink you in your moment of heedlessness. And when you feel that distance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you feel like you can't come back. You feel like you're never going to be able to approach Him again. And you forget all of those ahadith. The man who was a serial killer, who turned back to Allah and was forgiven. A woman who gave thirsty to a dog who had a profession of sin. But she gave water to a thirsty dog and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive her. You forget that Allah is approachable because shaitan takes you from a healthy feeling of regret to a feeling of absolute despair. Your Lord is approachable. Allah is approachable. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows how He created you and He loves you enough that when He sees you even in your most broken and vulnerable state, if you express any sense of sincerity and a desire to return, not only Will he allow you to return? He'll show you exactly how to get back to him. He doesn't shut those doors on you. And there are people that come to that realization and because of that, not only, not only do they get themselves out of the darkness, but they find meaning and purpose in why they were in that darkness in the first place so that they can help guide other people out of it. They don't become judgmental. They don't become arrogant. They don't become self-deluded. They become self-aware. And when you're self-aware, then you're able to guard from falling into that path again and you don't put down people that are on that path right now. But a person becomes self-aware and is willing to restrict themselves because of that self-awareness from things that they know are no longer good for them. That void that you have on the inside, what is it that leads a person to sin, seeking pleasure? Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is enough for you, you won't, be, you won't go searching for solutions outside of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to your problems and to what you feel like is not your happiness. Isn't Allah enough for His servants? So He said the only one who goes looking for solutions from shaitan is the one for whom Allah is not enough. When Allah is enough for you, then you don't go looking for that stuff. And when you compare the contentments of a believer that is connected to Allah, connected to their purpose, self-aware, you will never find that type of fulfillment and contentment elsewhere. It's impossible. That type of fulfillment cannot be found anywhere else. But you've got to address the void. And you've got to look to it. Why do I look for happiness outside of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to me? Why is it that so many people are willing to come from a free environment where everything is at their access and give it all up for Allah and fight 
fights off all sorts of pressure from their family, from their friends, from their circle, because they know that this is where happiness lies. When you know why you're here, and not only do you know why you're here, but you're doing what you're supposed to be doing in accordance with why you're here, and you know who you want to please and who you want to meet on the Day of Judgment while He is pleased with you. You're able to move past that. It sounds fluffy. It's not fluff. It's not a game. It's not this idealistic notion of spirituality and being fulfilled. It's real. And there are plenty of examples around you. People that realize that they got close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that they, when, they, when they come in tune to that, the more knowledgeable they are of Allah, the more knowledgeable they are of themselves. One of the most powerful things that Allah says in the Qur'an, O oh, you who believe, don't be like those who forgot Allah. So Allah caused them to forget themselves. They forgot Allah, so Allah caused them to forget themselves. The more you forget Him, the more you forget yourself and you forget why you're here. The more you know Him, the more you know yourself and know why you're here. And that knowledge of self is an incredible asset to be able to take on anything that's going to come your way. It's an amazing state of being to have. And it's not something that you get and then you have for the rest of your life. It's something that you get and that you have to keep on uh, increasing so that you don't lose it after you get there because a lot of people do. SubhanAllah, I had an opportunity, I'm not going to say who it was, but I was speaking to an athlete. Um, he's an NBA player, superstar, and he's considering accepting Islam. And he, I asked him why he's considering accepting Islam or what, what caused it. And you know what he said? He said, I'm peeling layers. I love that answer. He said, I'm peeling layers right now. And he said, and every time I read the Quran, I feel like I've peeled another layer. So that's profound. SubhanAllah, I'm peeling layers. That knowledge of self makes all of those things that take you away from that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suddenly unattractive. If you deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a contractual basis, a halal haram basis, and everything is a technicality to you, and every haram you're going to try to halalify with some fatwa that you're going to find out of nowhere, pull out of some obscure website on the internet, or your friend suddenly becomes a mufti, you know, where you just... <laughs> conversational fatwas that just come up and like, well, I don't think this is haram. I don't think, I don't think this is an obligation. I don't think this, I don't think that. You might numb yourself to be able to enjoy that moment of heedlessness, but you're not filling any void. You're not peeling any layers. You're not actually learning how fulfilling it is to liberate yourself by putting yourself in that servitude of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a game, it's real. There are athletes, superstars, celebrities, people that could have had everything of this world but decided that that's where they want to be. When you stand on the Day of Judgment, don't think about the people that are going to be standing that are doing worse than you. And this is, I think, one of the greatest problems we have with the exposure to so much that normalizes those unthinkable sins to us. Well, these people do it, that person does it, so it's not that big of a deal if I do it as well. When you think of yourself standing in front of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala on the Day of Judgment, don't think about people that are less than you. Allah knows if they're actually less than you or not, but people that are doing those things, standing there with you. Realize that on the day of judgment, when you stand before Allah, you will be standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the same day that Abu Bakr will be standing before Allah and Khadija will be standing before Allah. And great people will also be questioned by Allah on that same day. The profound narrations that I came across one day, it was about one of my favorite figures in history, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah ta'ala, that one day he was walking across the riverbank and he went out to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, in the early part of the day. And as he went out, he saw this man named Mujahid rahimahullah sitting at the riverbank remembering Allah. Mujahid is a very famous scholar of tafsir, the first person to write it down. Tafsir of the Quran, the student of Ibn Abbas and he saw the devotion that Mujahid had and how close he was to his Lord and he said to him, Woe to you, O Mujahid! How am I supposed to meet Allah on the same day that you meet Allah? How am I supposed to meet Allah on the same day that you meet Allah? He wasn't thinking about all the other people that looked up to him. He thought about the man that was in front of him that he looked up to, that he felt like would have a better portfolio to present to his creator on the day of judgment and he wanted to emulate that. That was his standard. So with all the garbage that gets unearthed and all of the things that get normalized online through the cancer of social media, that cannot become your world. Is Allah enough for me is a profound question that touches the very essence of faith. For a believer the concept of relying solely 
on Allah highlights the understanding that He is the ultimate provider and protector. No matter how overwhelming the challenges or how uncertain the circumstances, the Quran reassures. And whoever relies upon Allah, then He is sufficient for him. This verse reminds us that no matter what we face in life, our dependence on Allah alone can provide peace and clarity, knowing that He is in control. In moments of hardship, when human help falls short and material resources seem scarce, turning to Allah becomes the anchor that holds us steady. By placing complete trust in Him, a Muslim acknowledges that all worldly means are secondary and that Allah's wisdom surpasses our limited understanding. Trials and tribulations when approached with the mindset transform into opportunities to deepen one's relationship with Allah. The Prophet Muhammad wasallam emphasized this by teaching that whoever says Hasbi Allah huwa ni'mal wakil Allah is sufficient for me and he is the best disposer of affairs sincerely Allah will take care of their affairs ultimately believing that Allah is enough nurtures contentment in a world that constantly pushes us to seek more whether in wealth status or approval from others, knowing that Allah's presence is sufficient allows a believer to experience true inner peace. This reliance is not a passive surrender, but an active demonstration of faith, knowing that whatever happens, Allah's plan is always for the best. Help us build an Islamic studio at www.islamicstudio.org. Link in the description.